It's the uh, 10th of Feb uh, today. It's, about, it's almost midnight when I'm recording this. I did this workout at about 11 o'clock. Again, we're on a uh, late shift, so I started at 1 p.m. and I finished about 9.30. And I'll tell you what, man, never, never eat something and then go for a run. I felt so, so bloated. Really bad reflux. I was burping the entire run. Got a stitch after like two minutes. Uh, it just, it's just so uncomfortable and it's not productive. But I felt like I got through it by it's 20 minutes on the run. I said about 4.1 k's. Going around 12 k's an hour. I amped it up to 15 for the last sort of minute and 10 seconds. Um, and that was about it. Just filmed a quick, quick stretch. Uh, sped up forward here. And then we'll get to just 20 minutes of me on the runner. And uh, look, I think my thought process today and has been over the last couple of days is there's always someone worse. There's always someone worse off. And I know that's not the case for a lot of people and a lot of people think how someone you know, someone's got to be at the bottom. No one could be worse off than me. Uh, and look, that may that may be true, but I tell you what, man. Some people have got it rough and they've got it tough, and I think that's something I see being a, um, you know, an ICU nurse. Um, you know, not on a daily basis, but uh, you see it a few times a week. Uh, those exceptional cases where people are just dealt a rod in hand and are purely unlucky. One gentleman I looked after a couple of days ago and a few weeks before that um, is a man who was and just to be broad had had some sort of infection um, and it's quite a nasty bug, quite a nasty tropical bug. Uh, you get up here where I live and he's being treated on long-term antibiotics for. He had a you know, hospital stay. That was a couple of weeks. He went back out to his, uh, back out into the community, as we say, um, and then you know, proceeded to take his antibiotics as as prescribed and as recommended and as directed. Um, he was taking them for like a long time, like months, um, to you know slowly work out the infection and all the side effects from this infection. Uh, and unfortunately for this bugger. Um, you know, when you look at medications and any time a doctor prescribes you a medication or you take a medication, you always get warned about the side effects and what can happen if you have an adverse reaction. And when we're giving drugs in a hospital, we have this, this book in Australia, the Australian, um, the AMH, the Australian Medication Handbook, where you can type in, you know, you get on a computer or you have the actual physical book, you can look up any drug that is uh, licensed to be prescribed within this country and you will have its intended usage, its mode of action, its contraindications, um, some notes on how to prepare it, how the drug should be taken, dosage and then at the very bottom there's um, adverse reactions. It lists some sort of to common less common, rare, you know, very rare, something like that. And everyone sort of knows about the common side effects and even maybe a bit of the rare side effects, but when you scroll down and you get to the bottom and you see the severe side effects, that's the stuff you, you know, you rarely think of. And it happens to, you know, like one in a hundred million people, you know, kind of side effects. So this gentleman was taking this antibiotic, um, as directed, very good medication compliance on his end, and uh, he had a adverse reaction from this drug. And what this adverse reaction was, uh, it was it was basically uh, an autoimmune response. It triggered a sort of unnatural autoimmune response within his body, uh, where all of his skin cells started to break down and not replace themselves. Your skin cells 
you know, along with your hair cells and your nail cells and a lot of your oral mucosa in your mouth and lining your gut, stuff like that, they replicate very quickly. Um, so, you know, you, they die off. You, you know, you get dry skin and stuff like that, but, you know, dead skin cells. Uh, so they, you know, skin cells die, they dry up, they fall off. You have new skin cells to replace them uh, quite quickly. And this man, uh, due to this adverse reaction, he lost all his ability to do that. So his skin was just becoming necrotic and dead. And he lost most of the layers of his skin. He lost deep dermal layers of skin. And I looked after him, you know, a week and a half ago. And he's just sitting there, obviously, in a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort. And he's oozing from, you know arms, limbs, chest, back, bum, you know, wherever. Uh, all his skin's falling off and he's just picking skin like he literally like degloved his hand in front of someone and just ripped, pulled all the skin off his hand because it was hanging off and he, you know, couldn't bear the sight of it just hanging there so he pulled it off himself. Um, so that was last week and unfortunately for him he's had to come to ICU because there's a risk of, um, of him losing his airway. Um, if you don't know ICU too well, basically, if you come to ICU, uh, we just we ninety percent of the time we deal with your heart and your lungs. Um, so we come, you come there to if we are trying to manage use cardiovascularly or you know something to do with uh, any respiratory problems. He was at risk of losing his airway because the whole lining of his oral mucosa and basically everything from his mouth. Um, you know, down his um, trachea, his, down to his esophagus was peeling off and degrading and there's a re there was a risk that he could go into respiratory failure or this could progress into his lungs and he'd slowly um, start losing functioning in his lungs and need intubation. So from last week he was sitting there, he was talking, he was fine, no oxygen requirement, just you know, obvious a lot of discomfort and with a lot of open wounds. And I come back a couple of days ago and he you know, he went downhill, uh, just needed intubation, I stuck him on a ventilator, put a uh, breathing tube down his throat and he's he's just so crook. Uh, for one positive for him though, all his skin had finally peeled off after you know, a couple of weeks and what was left now was this pink epi epithelializing skin is what we call it uh, it's just uh, an another stage in your skin development process um, and it's you know it's really interesting when you see a black man a man who is proper dark black skin dark skin tone um, look pink because that's you know that's how his skin's growing back and that's how it's healing so it's interesting seeing this man who if you've ever seen necrotic, anything necrotic, anything necrotic is black, it's dead, dead cells. Um, he was a dark coloured man and then was just even more, you know, dark with bits of black falling off him a week ago now to seeing him, you know, almost pink. Oh, it was quite something. Um, anyway, it's, it'll be a long road. Uh, if he recovers, still don't know if he will recover. But man, I just think about it sometimes, and I, you know, I think I'm so grateful and I'm so lucky for all the things that I have in my life. I'm fit, I'm healthy, I have a roof over my head. I'm able to go to the shops and not worry about how much I'm spending on food. Um, I have a car to get me places, and I'm generally, you know, I'm generally a happy, dude. And I generally don't have too many problems, and you just you look at a guy like this, and you go, he did. He did everything right, and trust me, there are a lot of people that, when you discharge them from hospital or they take their own leave from hospital against and discharge against medical advice, and they go out and they do, you know, what are considered all the wrong things by their health, and you know they might still live until their 70s and their 80s, uh, sort of come back as repeat offenders to hospitals, what we call them, frequent flyers, uh, because they look after themselves so poorly. But here you have a man. Who he's got a wife, he's got a kids, um, doesn't have too many 
other health issues or comorbidities, um, looks after himself, he takes his medication as directed and doesn't slip up and then bam, he's just hit with his massive adverse reaction which is, you know, one in a million, uh, one in ten million. And you just, yeah, you just got to sit and think how, how grateful you are and how lucky, uh, so especially I am, how lucky I am to be in the position that I'm in right now. Um, this guy is, you know, fighting for his life at the moment and has been in some of the most excruciating pain leading up to that before he was, you know, intubated and put in, you know, like a medically induced coma. We've sedated him now. Um, so, look, you, you'd like to think hopefully he's, he's comfy now and he's not in any more pain while he's fighting this off. But for the first couple of weeks, he was in excruciating pain and... I think no, he got to a point where no matter what you'd give him, he was uh, he was feeling it either way. And you just think about people in these positions, and I think about the position I'm in, where you know I you know I have the time, I have the energy to have this goal of training every day and you know trying to improve myself that way and trying to find things to improve myself. Where there's people out there who are just looking to survive and are on you know, dripping and clawing and clinging to life uh, as best they can and, you know, some of them are just holding on. But it was a, it was a bit of a heavy week for that as well. Um, it also got me thinking about quality of life. Um, in ICU, generally, we have to have a lot of these discussions with people's family members uh, when someone has sort of a poor prognosis after a few days of their admission, or, you know, if they have a disease or you know, a nasty head injury, you know, if they've got a poor prognosis and we expect a poor outcome, now we have to inform the family and look, these are the decisions we'd like to make. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time it's, you know, we we think we have done all we can and we're, we're going to start withdrawing care. And, you know, your loved, your, your loved one, your, your mother, your father, your daughter, your brother, sister, uncle, friend, um, whatever is 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 going to die, um, or you know you're asking the family member, you know, do you want us to keep them on life support and give them every chance of surviving, knowing that there's a high likelihood that this person could be somewhat incapacitated um, for the rest of their life. Yeah, and I just I just think of that again as you know, wait, how do you weigh up quality of life? And it's always this decision of quality versus quantity. Like we can have you pretty much living forever if we really want. Like it takes a it takes a fair whack to kill you these days if you live in a in a first world country with uh, developed healthcare and things like that. Uh, so it takes a fair whack to kill you, and we can keep you alive for quite a long time. But uh, what, what sort of quality does that give you? Just because we can keep you alive doesn't mean you are going to live a life. Um, just take, take dialysis as a, as a perfect example for some people. Um, for whatever reason, your kidneys stop working, whether it's genetic, you're born with it, um, or you've you know, abused your diabetes, raging diabetes, or you've drunk your, you know, you've drunk your kidneys to death uh, with booze. Now you have a choice. If you don't, you know, your kidneys are gone. If you don't do something to flush out all those toxins and all that fluid, you will eventually die, and it will be probably a slow, painful death over maybe a week and a bit, two weeks. Um, or you can do dialysis and you can dialyze three times a week. But that means for the rest of your life, you're not going to be able to go anywhere that doesn't have a dialysis machine. Um, you may have one at your home, you may have to go into a hospital or a clinic to use one, but for the rest of your life, if you want to continue living, you will have to be within one day of a dialysis machine because you're going to have to dialyze three days a week. And it's, you know, it's tough. You see some people who are relatively, you know, okay, they're surrounded by their loved ones and their family and uh, they can see and they can enjoy a quality of life where they can still do things that bring them enough happiness um, 
you know, whilst living in you know, like a metropolitan area or somewhere that's close to medical facilities where they can get their dialysis or they're fortunate enough to be able to have one brought into their home and they can afford to use one and teach themselves how to use one uh, themselves. But it doesn't mean that you can go on a holiday somewhere if you want to go on a trip or if you want to go interstate or overseas to see family or something like that. You you have to pre-plan, you know, you know, if you can go to a clinic, if you can go to a hospital and dialyze. And usually if you go internationally, it's very hard to find. And even interstate, it's a little bit of a juggle uh, because these lists are usually booked out quite well in advance. So you might have to book months in advance uh, to get this opportunity uh, and if you don't dialyze you you become fluid overloaded so you can't clear your fluid uh, it eventually you know goes into your um, sort of goes into your extracellular fluid so your arms will swell up your legs will swell up and then eventually intravascularly it'll back up all the way to your heart you'll start getting heart problems then from there it'll back up into your lungs uh, and you'll slowly, essentially, just drown on, drown on that fluid. Um, all in all, keeping in mind that all your metabolites and your electrolytes aren't being cleared, so your sodium's going up, your potassium's going up, your calcium's going up, your creatinine and your urea's going up. So, if you know, if you don't choke or drown on your own fluids, you're probably going to have a heart attack because your potassium goes through the roof, or because you don't have any blood pressure anymore because your heart just can't pump can't pump it to you know maintain a blood pressure so you think about these things and you think about life versus quality of life and you know on the other hand as a person they can find happiness you know say if they're on dialysis there are equally the amount of people that are almost wishing for it to be over they've been on it for 10 15 years you know longer than what is expected of someone to be able to last on dialysis um, They've missed out on family gatherings, funerals, weddings, births of children. Um, they've missed out on traveling. They've never gone anywhere else. Um, they've missed out on a few things they see as uh, big opportunities, missed opportunities in life. Um, well, you know, they're not able to meet anyone where they live. They'd like to try somewhere else, but they can't move because if they move, they're going to get you know, get off this dialysis machine. Uh, you can't do social outings these certain days of the week, so you're sort of you're dialysing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So you're blocking off a large chunk of these days just to do this. Um, dialysis go from anywhere between two, two to five to six hours, really. Um, so you look at these people and you think about quality of life versus quantity of life. Um, and then, you know, you sort of have the other hand as well. You have people that just care about the quantity. All they want to do is live as long as they can because they're afraid of death. Uh, and you see a, people, a lot of people that are afraid of dying. Um, and it's normally the ones, in my experience, from working in this, this sort of acute setting where, you know, if you go to ICU, you're, that's the closest you will be to death. If you make it out of ICU in a hospital, that will be the closest you have physically been to death. It's coming to an ICU in a hospital. But I think, yeah, usually it's those people that um, are afraid of death. They don't have any religion or they don't have any comfort or they have regret. A lot of them have a lot of regret and they want, they want to bargain for more time. And they think if they can just get through this or if they can just hold on, um, they'll get more time to do the things they want to fulfill their life. Uh, and same with family as well. You normally see family members hold on longer than they should, you know, out of love. And I would, I don't know what I would do if it was my family member in that position. Honestly, I don't wish that upon anyone. But you will see people keep their loved ones alive and hold on as long as possible uh, until they're gone. Even when you know us, you know, probably medical professionals know that you know this this patient we're treating has been gone for a number of days but the family will just hold on and hold on uh, for any sign of hope or miracle or anything like that 
and usually one, you know, obviously it's always out of love. I think first and foremost, it's always out of love. Two, it's out of fear. Uh, fear of losing this person, fear of losing uh, yourself. You don't know what you're going to do if you know this, this loved one of yours passes away. Um, you don't know what will happen to them as well. I think if you, especially if you have no belief, um, I think the human soul is probably a very powerful thing. And if you don't have a belief in that uh, the soul will go on or the soul will live on or will transfer into something else or whatever, I think it's quite hard to come to terms with the thought of when you die everything just goes black and that everything you have experienced, created, lived, lost, loved, everything that encompasses you in, in this, you know, this flesh, this body, uh, dies with it and goes away with it and you know there's no sense of it going anywhere I think that's hard to come to terms with as well for some people um, which is why I also see people holding on uh, when they're in dire straits you know in ICUs and in hospitals in general we usually have plans uh, called you know, goals of care what are our goals of care what are our limits to our goals of care you know, is this person, you know, is this person for CPR, for example? You know, do you want your 90-year-old grandma for CPR so that when she's in a hospital and arrests, uh, five people jump on her and start jumping on her chest to get her heart beating? And if there's a chance of reviving her, you know, she's going to wake up with a stack full of broken ribs, maybe a punctured lung and, you know, probably a long stay in hospital. Is it worth it? Is it worth all that trauma and all that... Um, all those setbacks just to live maybe a couple more months, maybe a couple more years. Um, who am I to say when someone should live or die? And I think almost to a fact that who, you know, I don't think any man, woman, child, person on this earth um, has the right to say that. And I think it's one of the hardest things anyone will have to do in their life and uh, you know, I only, you know, dread the day that I may have to do it um, for a loved one in my family, but I think assessing that quality of life, the quantity of life, is something that is on my mind a lot and I think I takes up a lot of thinking at the moment. Uh, especially, there's just been a lot of death in ICU, really. Um, over the last couple of months, not due to COVID or anything like that, but just people getting sick, you know, people, unlucky people, people not looking after themselves, doing the wrong thing by their health. Um, you know, a real mix. But it just makes me think of how grateful I am. I think how grateful a lot of us should be uh, at the positions we are in and how you, know, you, can, you can be fine one day and incredibly unlucky the next and it's through no fault of your own and it is just through you know life this thing we call life um then who's to say you know who's to judge you know the quality of our life um other than ourselves i think we are the best judges of how we want to live our life and how we have lived our life and how we choose to live it in this moment and I don't think anyone who has to make those decisions on behalf of someone else um, can ever quantify that completely. Um, so yeah, look, I'm just going to leave it with that, that thought today. Got this run in just before midnight. So it's the 10th, baby. We got, a, got that day of training, I think 41 days today. Feeling good, lots of thoughts. Um, yeah, cheers. I will. Um, I'll see you in the next one tomorrow. Eh?